On back right. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 13 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Uh, there's a great deal of contrast in it, and uh, currently it's upside down on our monitor, but we can make out uh, a fair amount of detail. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Sunday, July 20th, 1969. Around the world, nearly a billion people watched this moment on television as the first man from Earth prepared to set foot upon the moon. At the foot of the ladder, the lamb footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. All that we have accomplished in space, all that we may accomplish in days and years to come, we stand ready to share for the benefit of all mankind. As we explore the reaches of space, let us go to the new worlds together. Not as new worlds to be conquered, but as a new adventure to be shared. Since the earliest time man has imagined this moment, the moment when his fellow man would make the first journey to the moon. Now the time had come. In the sixth decade of the 20th century, the ancient dream was to become a reality. The flight of Apollo 11 was the culmination of many years of planning, working, building, and testing. Thousands of people had contributed toward this day of accomplishment. The great Saturn V rocket and the complex Apollo spacecraft had been assembled together and moved to the launch pad. The equipment and techniques and personnel had been proved in earlier missions, and now they were ready. The astronauts chosen for this mission had flown it many times in ground-based simulators. They had all been in space before. They had trained carefully and well. And now, they too were ready. Astronaut Michael Collins would pilot the Apollo Command Module. Astronaut Edwin Aldrin, Jr. would pilot the Lunar Module. and astronaut Neil Armstrong would serve as mission commander. Armstrong would be the first man to step upon the moon. July 16th, the day had come. The moon awaited. The men rose early, ate breakfast, and dressed in their spacesuits. Other astronauts had made this journey to the launch pad, but never with such anticipation. 9.32 a.m., July 16th.
Three hours later, the Apollo command module moves forward to extract the lunar module from the third stage of the launch vehicle. Both are moving at more than 17,000 miles an hour. Docked together, they will sail a quarter million miles across the sea of space and into orbit around the Earth's nearest neighbor. Can we understand that you are, Doc? During the three-day journey to the moon, the astronauts kept busy. Checklists, navigation and observation, housekeeping. They must work in a weightless environment, keeping their spacecraft and themselves in good condition. Data must be collected and reported. Experiments must be performed including photography both inside and outside the spacecraft. Because of the film speed, these actions appear faster than they actually were. July 19th, Apollo 11 slows down and goes into orbit around the moon. The bright blue planet of Earth now lies 238,000 miles beyond the lunar horizon. Astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin, now in the lunar module, separate from the command module. Astronaut Collins remains behind. Preparation for the lunar module descent to the moon now begins. The command module assumes the new name, Columbia. The lunar module will be called the Eagle. From Columbia, Michael Collins' camera sees bright rays of the sun reflecting patterns of color from the surface of the Eagle. In this strange metallic bird, rides the ancient and endless dream of all mankind. The command pilot can see detail which his camera cannot record. The four landing pads of the lunar module are fully extended and locked in place. The eagle is poised and prepared for its descent to the lunar surface. craft rocket engine fires to slow it down and to place it on the pathway to the landing site in the sea of tranquility. There is tension and caution as the eagle flies lower. Warning lights blink on as the computer tries to keep up with the demand for control data, but the status remains go. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good. Over. Roger, copy. Eagle Houston after yaw around, angles, uh, S-band pitch, minus niner, yaw, plus one eight. Roger, you're a go to, con you're a go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. Altitude now 21,000 feet, still looking very good. Velocity down now to 1,200 feet per second. You're looking great to us, Eagle. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Roger, we got you, we're going at alarm. Good radar data. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Top alarm. Altitude 1,600. 1,400 feet. Still looking very good. 700 feet, 21 down. 33 degrees. 100 feet down at 19. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 
We're go, same type, we're go. Altitude, velocity, light, and down, 220 feet, 15 forward, 11 forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet, four and a half down, five and a half down, 60 seconds, lights on, down two and a half, forward, forward, Good. 40 feet down, two and a half, Picking up some dust. Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. Good. Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Through the window of the Eagle, Armstrong and Aldrin see what no human eyes have ever seen before. Their spacecraft casts a long shadow across the undisturbed dust of centuries. Seven hours after landing, after careful preparations for later ascent were completed, Armstrong opens the Eagle hatch and begins his climb down to the surface. first footsteps on this strange new world must be taken cautiously. The moon has only one-sixth the gravity of Earth. The nature of its surface was still unknown. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Once on the surface, Armstrong scoops up a small sample of lunar dust and rock, precaution against the possibility of an emergency takeoff. According to plan, astronaut Aldrin now descends from the Eagle. He and his equipment would weigh 383 pounds on Earth. Here, they weigh about 66 pounds. moment, the first men on the moon stand and look at the stark, lonely landscape around them, an experience which no one before them can share. But there is much to be done in the limited time which they can stay on this airless, cloudless satellite of Earth. This sheet of metal foil traps and holds particles from the sun, the so-called solar wind, or barrage of solar energy, which constantly strikes the moon's surface. Results of this experiment will be taken back to Earth to reveal new secrets to anxious scientists. An American flag is left behind on the moon, together with medals honoring American and Soviet spacemen who lost their lives in earlier space tests, and a small disk carrying messages of goodwill from 73 nations on Earth. A plaque on the lunar module reads, 
Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. Through a specially made television camera, viewers in many nations on Earth were able to watch the astronauts as they walked and worked on the moon. Despite the bulky spacesuits and the backpacks containing oxygen, temperature control, and communications equipment, the Apollo 11 crew found they could move easily about the surface. Because there is no wind or rain on the moon, these footprints will remain for centuries. In addition to collecting rock and soil samples, the explorers leave behind a seismometer. This highly sensitive device would send back valuable information on external meteoroid impacts, as well as internal lunar movements. prism laser reflector would help man to measure the exact distance from Earth to Moon to an accuracy of six inches. These were the first of many experiments which will be taken to the Moon to provide man continuing and increasing knowledge about the Moon and the vastness of space beyond. After two hours and 31 minutes, the first lunar explorers had completed their research on the Moon. A night of rest in the lunar module, countdown preparations, and they were ready to come home. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston. Guidance recommendation uh, is pings, and you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, right, understand. We're number one on the runway. Seven, six, five, work stage, engine arm ascent. feet high, 80 feet uh, per second vertical rise. Eagle Houston, uh, you're looking good at two. Ping, zags, and misspin, all agree. I'm going right down US-1. Eagle Houston, going right down the track. Everything's great. Horizontal velocity approaching 2,500 feet per second. Roger. Some 120 miles to go until insertion. July 21st. The Eagle and its two-man crew lifted off the moon perfectly and climbed slowly to rendezvous and dock with the mother ship, Columbia. Armstrong and Aldrin explored the moon, astronaut Collins had kept a long and lonely vigil in the Columbia. The approaching eagle was a welcome sight. Later, the three men would share their reflections on this adventure with the world. I believe that uh, from the early space flights, we demonstrated a potential to carry out this type of a mission. And again, it was a question of time until this would be accomplished. I think it's a technical triumph for this country to have uh, said what it was going to do a number of years ago, and then by golly do it. The relative ease with which we were able to carry out our mission, which of course came after a very efficient and logical sequence of flights, 
I think that this demonstrated that uh, we were certainly on the right track when we took this commitment to, to go to the moon. I just see it uh, as a beginning, a beginning of a new age. Once again, the bright blue planet of Earth rises over the lunar horizon. For those who had witnessed man's landing in the Sea of Tranquility, the moon would never again appear quite the same. July 24th, dawn in the Pacific. Apollo blazes across the heavens, coming back to Earth at 25,000 miles an hour. President Richard Nixon, who had talked with the astronauts by telephone while they were on the moon, was waiting aboard the recovery carrier to welcome the returning voyagers. The president later expressed the nation's response to this historic mission. Some way, when those two Americans stepped on the moon, the people of this world were brought closer together. That it is that spirit, the spirit of Apollo, that America can now help to bring to our relations with other nations. The spirit of Apollo transcends geographical barriers and political differences it can bring the people of the world together in peace. To protect against any possible lunar contamination, the astronauts put on airtight special garments before coming aboard the rescue ship. They transferred directly from the helicopter to a mobile quarantine van in which they would be flown back to the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas. July 27th. The journey was ended. They were home again.
ahead lay three weeks of isolation, medical tests, and mission debriefings. Then visits to major cities of America and abroad. The details of their unique mission would be relived and remembered so that others might learn what they had learned and that future travelers in space might build upon their experience. The rock and soil samples brought back would be examined and analyzed by scientists in many lands. They would reveal new insights into the origin and the age and the composition of the moon, and perhaps new knowledge of the Earth as well. Already experiments left on the moon were sending back revealing new information. The mission was successfully completed. The Eagle had landed the first men on the moon and Columbia had returned them safely to Earth. Wherever man journeys tomorrow across the ocean of our universe, history will remind him that Apollo 11 was mankind's first encounter with a new world. driving rain. Pete Conrad reports that your program is in. Tower clear. The pitch in a roll program and this baby is really going. 36 seconds later, lightning struck the spacecraft. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. We had everything in the world drop out. I'm not sure if you hit by lightning. Fuel cell lights and easy bus lights, fuel cell disconnect, easy bus overload, one and two, main bus A and B out. Okay, we're all organized again, Jack. We've had a couple of cardiac arrests down here too, Pete. Now they settle down to the routine of the outward flight. We're trying all these things that we didn't have in Germany, like toothpaste and shaving. Roger. All dressed up and no place to go. Oh, we're going someplace. We can see it get bigger and bigger all the time. Then, on November 17th, they prepared for orbit around the moon. Our uh, motion to the left is not as apparent as our motion towards the moon, and therefore, we have the decided impression that we're going right into the center of that baby right now. Okay, Houston, we're maneuvering to the burn attitude. Roger, we copy that, 12. The next day, Pete Conrad and Alan Bean entered the lunar module, leaving Dick Gordon in the command module. Now the Intrepid and Yankee Clipper undocked and separated, preparatory to Intrepid's descent and landing on the moon. Okay, here you go again. Maybe. There he goes. Okay, Houston, the sim's running pretty smooth today. How many feet? As with the orbit insertion burn, the burn to begin descent was made behind the moon. Mission Control again contacted Intrepid as it came over the horizon. Intrepid Houston, how do you read? Hello, Houston Intrepid. Roger, we read you loud and clear. We had a great DOI burn. And we just watched the first Earth rise, which was fantastic. But now it was time to exit the Intrepid and begin the exploration and experiments. Conrad climbed out first. Hey, I'll tell you what we're 
we're parked next to. Yeah. We're about 25 feet in front of the surveyor. <laughs> That's good. I we wanted to be. I, got, I, I bet you when I get down to the bottom of the ladder, I can see the surveyor. prepared an experiments package to be left on the moon, an automated scientific station called ALSEP that would send information to Earth for a year, powered by a nuclear electric generator. They moved to the site selected to set up the station. put together the experiment station. How far do you estimate we're from the lamp? 600 feet? 700 feet? ALSEP, an acronym for Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package. Piece by piece, they assemble the station. measure atomic particles thrown off by the sun as they strike the moon. A device to measure the moon's tenuous atmosphere. A magnetometer to measure the lunar magnetic field, which would later be found to be 10 to 20 times stronger than many scientists had expected. A seismometer to measure physical properties of the crust and interior and the data station to collect the experimental measurements and transmit them to Earth. With ALSEP deployed, Conrad and Bean began collecting geological samples. They drove a core tube into the surface to collect soil from various depths. show you're uh, three hours and seven minutes into it, into the EVA, and we'd like you back uh, to the LEM to start the closeout in ten minutes. That's at three plus one seven. Bean re-entered the lunar module first. Conrad, using a transfer apparatus similar to a clothesline reel, sent the samples up to him. Then, Conrad, too, left the lunar surface. Roger, we got that beat at uh, three hours and 50 minutes into the EVA. Yeah, yep, the ladder I come. I hope, I hope, <laughs> So they rose to their rendezvous, and from Dick Gordon and Yankee Clipper. Please sure look straight down there, bump down the sand dunes. All right. At half a mile, uh, 19 feet a second. Looking better all the time, Yankee. Okay, I'm down to three feet a second. Intrepid now, station keeping uh, with the Yankee Clipper. The two vehicles move together for docking. Okay, we've had a problem here. This 
Mrs. Houston, say again, please. Uh, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13. We're looking at it. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. And as I recall, main B was the one that uh, had a amp spike on it uh, once before. And the interim here, uh, we're starting to uh, go ahead and button up the tunnel again. Uh, the sensation I had uh, that I had felt a vibration accompanying the bang, uh, not a large vibration or shudder. Is there any uh, kind of leads we can give them? Are we looking at instrumentation? Have we got a real problem or what? We're reading uh, zero N2 pressure in fuel cell one and 13 PSI on uh, fuel cell three O2 pressure. Okay, Barrett, what do you want to do? Open circuit fuel cell one and three? That's for flight. Shut down uh, uh, the reactance valve and I uh, ask for reconfirmation since uh, when you do that it's sort of irreversible if you shut one of these things down they uh, uh, only can be restarted from uh, ground support equipment yeah that's the uh, case of ac and it looks to me looking out the uh, hatch that we are venting something we are uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh into space okay let's everybody think of the kind of things we'd be venting gnc you got anything that looks abnormal in your system negative light how about you, Econ? You see anything that, uh, with the instrumentation you got that could be venting? That's a firm flight. Let me look at the system flight as far as the venting is concerned. Okay, let's start scanning. Here is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. My concern was increasing all the time. It went from, I wonder what this is going to do to the landing, so I wonder if we can get back home again. Okay, come, I'm coming back to you. Flight, go ahead. I think the best thing we can do right now is start a power down. Right about then, it, uh, it was quite apparent to me that it was just a question of time that the command module was going to be dead. You don't want to get fuel cell pumps off, do you? We can do that on fuel cell number one flight. Okay, well, let's make sure we don't blow the whole mission. When I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down, uh, it, it dawned on me, and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time, that we were indeed in serious trouble. The only way to survive the situation was to transfer to the LEM. Flight Econ. Go ahead, Econ. The pressure in O2 tank one is all the way down to 297. You better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. I'd say this is as serious a situation as we have ever had in manned space flight. We've always called the LEM a good lifeboat under those circumstances. If at any time in the mission, however, the LEM had separated and we had gotten ourselves into a rendezvous situation or uh, the, the command module being around the moon, then what you state is absolutely true. It would, it would be a fatal situation. Tell me you're from flight. Go ahead, Flight. I want you to get some guys figuring out minimum power in the LEM to sustain life. The accident had occurred 200,000 miles from Earth. Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes rode in the lunar module attached to a lifeless command module. Apollo 13 had started as a mission of scientific exploration. It was now a matter of survival. One of the big problems was consumables. There would be enough to eat and drink. But in space, there are other factors. Oxygen to breathe, electrical power to keep the spacecraft alive, water to cool the equipment and keep it operating. What we'll be doing till we get them back on the water is concentrating on everything that is de their, their lives are dependent upon at the moment rather than worrying about the accident because there's nothing we can do about that now. This, it appears at the present time that everything is under control and that uh, we have a safe situation at the moment. Hey, I want to say you guys are doing real good work. So are you guys, Jack. We are about 70 hours from home and uh, we think we have uh, uh, the situation in control. We've projected the uh, consumables as I've described and uh, we have a plan for carrying out the rest of the mission, but uh, uh, there's going to be no relaxation at all as far as that goes from now until splash. They passed 137 miles from the moon. 
For Lovell, it was the second time that he had seen the moon so near. But there was no time for contemplation. There was another critical burn coming. On April 17th, they prepared for re-entry. After a small course correction burn, they jettisoned the damaged service module. Uh, uh, copy that. And there's one whole side of that big uh, Is that right? And the whole panel is blown out, almost from the uh, base to the uh, engine. It's really a mess. Man, that's unbelievable. Next, they got back into Odyssey to jettison Aquarius prior to entry into the atmosphere. That's good. Okay, copy that. Farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. Okay, LOS in uh, a minute or a minute and a half. Uh, an entry attitude, we'd like Omni Charlie. And welcome home. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Call, Captain, that when I spoke to you on the phone, you said that you regretted that you were unable to complete your mission. I hereby declare that this was a successful mission. From the start, the exploration of space has been hazardous adventure. The voyage of Apollo 13 dramatized its risks. The men of Apollo 13, by their poise and skill, under the most intense kind of pressure, epitomize the character that accepts danger and surmounts it. Theirs is the spirit that filled America. Your mission served your country. It served to remind us all of our proud heritage of a nation, to remind us that in this age of technicians and scientific marvels, that the individual still counts, that in a crisis, the character of a man or of men will make the difference.
On February 4th, Apollo 14 went into orbit around the moon. Right, this is really a wild place up here. As Apollo 14 was on its first orbit, the third stage of the booster smashed into the moon at its planned target point. Its impact picked up by the seismometer left by Apollo 12. The structure of the moon's interior is one of the major mysteries of lunar science. Now another piece was added that could help solve the puzzle. Later that day, Shepard and Mitchell climbed into the lunar module Antares and undocked prior to descent. And we're free. Beautiful. Very good. Ten seconds to go. Okay, there's pitch over. Right there it is. Right out the window, just like Cone Crater, a major objective of this mission to Fra Mauro. A hole blasted in the moon's surface eons ago that could provide a scientific clue to the history of the moon, the Earth, and the solar system. Ten years later, 114 hours, 22 minutes after leaving Earth, Alan Shepard stepped onto the moon. It looks like you're about on the bottom step and on the surface. That's bad for it, old man. Okay, you're right. Alan's on the surface, and it's been a long way, but we're here. Four minutes later, he was joined by Ed Mitchell. This one is a long one. Following the tradition of two previous missions, Shepard and Mitchell planted the flag in the lunar soil. How's this, Bruce? Look okay? Uh, yeah, that's a good site. Finding a suitable site to place the scientific instruments was the next order of business. Shepard and Mitchell now began setting up the automated scientific laboratory a small nuclear generator to power the array, the central station to transmit data to Earth, a seismometer to detect and measure activity on and within the moon, a series of three experiments to measure charged particles near the lunar surface, an independent experiment to reflect laser beams from Earth enabling extremely precise measurements of such things as Earth to moon distance, the wobble of the Earth's axis, continental drift, and shifts of the Earth's crust. And a mortar to be fired by a signal from Earth sometime within the next year. The impact of its charges would be picked up by Apollo 14's seismometer. As a final exercise, Mitchell used the thumper a device to explode a series of controlled, shotgun-like charges. The vibrations from these detonations were picked up by a series of instruments he had previously deployed. With the instruments set up and operating, they headed back toward Antares, pausing on the way to collect samples. They loaded their 44 pounds of lunar material aboard the lunar module, and after four hours and 50 minutes on the surface, climbed back into Antares. As Shepard and Mitchell rested, Stuart Rusa continued his work from lunar orbit. His photographs would have meaning not only to the scientific community, but would have direct bearing on the planning for coming missions. But now Shepard and Mitchell pushed on. After a brief stop at a second survey site, they began their assault on Cone Crater, a climb not only toward the summit of a lunar mountain, but back through time. A large crater acts in many respects like a drill, throwing out material from deep beneath the surface. This material should be very different from any we've collected before perhaps dating back to the origins of the moon and even the solar system. Why don't we pull up beside this big crater, take a break, 
Get the map, see if we can find out exactly where we are. The maps they were using had been made from photography from lunar orbit. The hummocks, craters, ridges, and boulders took on a new appearance when seen from the surface. The limb looks like it's got a flat over there the way it's leaning. Uh, start on up to it, Graham? Yeah, just one second, though. Hey, pull a while out. We're having all the fun. And the grade's getting pretty steep. Al's got the back of the mat down. We're carrying it up. I think it seems easier. Well, I tell you, we're really going to get a panorama. We've got a tremendous one here. We're just in our already. And we're not quite to the rim. But the rocks and boulders get more numerous toward the top here. Now they were working against time, against the oxygen and water left in their backpacks, against the alien terrain. Top a ridge, thinking it's the rim of the crater, and there's another ridge ahead of you. Standing in a boulder field surrounded by rocks 10 to 12 feet long, the astronauts made their most difficult decision. With the concurrence of mission control, they stopped their climb less than 150 feet from the edge to begin the more important job of collecting samples. The crew had no way of realizing they were so close. It was a week after the mission before we determined this by photographic analysis. Again, it was time. Time to head back to the lunar module. We're approaching the limb now. Coming in a far mile base. After a quick side trip to check on the science station, they loaded the lunar module with samples and data and stepped off the lunar surface. The second expedition had lasted four hours and 35 minutes, a total exploration of a record nine and one half hours. 33 and a half hours after they landed, Alan Shepard and Edgar Mitchell lifted off in the silent vacuum of the moon. Captain engine is armed. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, this will be other ignition. What a lift off. And a lift off. Roger, ignition. Boom. Uh, there's over. switch over. Ten seconds. Roger. Hey, baby. Over is good. Okay, I shall do a loop later. Okay, make it smooth. And around we go. Show us the roof style. Oh, you look good. There I was at 240,000 coming over the top. That's our home away from home. Would you believe 360,000? Yeah. Kitty Hawk is doing an extremely smooth loop. We're sitting at uh, 70 feet. 
Watching him go around, he looks very clean. Extremely important that relates to the question of why, we, why we're fooling around with the moon. It's really that the, the imprint of history, of solar system history, on the Earth-Moon system is centered on the moon for the first billion years. What we hope to gain is we've got a window right now between t equals zero, the beginning of the solar system, and when the Earth so totally messed up itself that we can't look at it anymore. We'd like to look in there, and that window's on the moon. Apollo 14 has already had a very big scientific impact, and we still have three missions left. They'll be heading into even more rugged and more interesting areas of the moon. Five miles above the moon, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin looked out the window of their lunar module down toward Al Warden in the command module, which had completed its separation maneuver. Beneath them, the 15,000-foot peaks of the lunar Apennine Mountains. Soon they would fly low over those peaks on their way to a landing in a little valley in the mountains of the moon. Coming up on pitch over. P-64, okay? We have LPD. LPD. Coming right. Out their window they could see Four the zero. sinuous meanderings of the lunar P66. canyon known as Hadley okay. Rill as they brought their lunar module, call sign Falcon, toward its landing, and the beginning of what would be one of the most significant chapters in the history of scientific exploration. Scott and Irwin were located on an undulating plain situated between the Apennines and Hadley Rill, an area selected by the scientists as being one of the most geologically significant sites on the moon. Hey, overhead hatch is open and latch. Two hours after touchdown, Dave Scott stood up in Falcon's upper hatch to survey their landing area. Oh boy. What a view. Uh, I can see uh, Bhutan and Icarus. As and Scott King. stood describing the craters and mountains, we on Earth perhaps did not yet realize the scope and extent of the coming mission. Aboard the lunar module was a small dune buggy-like car called the Lunar Roving Vehicle, or just plain Rover. The astronauts would travel miles in collecting samples and placing and conducting experiments. Uh, there are no sharp, jagged peaks. There are no large boulders apparent anywhere. They would observe the layering of the lunar terrain, most clearly seen in the formation 14 miles to the south, called Silver Spur. This layering, later to be observed in the mountains and the rill, gives scientists a direct look at the structure of the moon and a deeper insight as to the significance of the collected samples. July 31st. After a night's rest, Dave Scott descended into the lunar morning. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at its greatest. Scott was then joined by Jim Irwin. Oh boy, beautiful out here. Reminded me of Sun Valley. Their first job was to get the lunar roving vehicle out of its storage bay. Looks like she's coming down okay. Jim? Up, up. That looks good. Boy, is this dirt soft. Like soft powder snow. 
Next, the astronauts tried out the rover. During this test drive, one failure showed up. The rover was designed to steer through both its front and rear wheels. I don't have any front steering, Joe. But just rear steering, Dave. Yeah. In use, the absence of front wheel steering would hardly be noticed. Then they loaded the equipment they would need for their geological survey and boarded the rover for their first exploration. Okay, we're moving forward, Joe. Roger. They were headed toward St. George Crater, located on a mountain slope above Hadley Rill to the south of the landing site. There would be a stop to collect samples at a smaller crater called Elbow, then arrival at the base of St. George, and a look into Hadley Rill. Oh, look at that. Oh, look back there, Jim. Look at that. That's yeah. beautiful. That is spectacular. This is unreal. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Scott then adjusted the television antenna on the rover. A quarter of a million miles away, in Houston's mission control, a flight controller operated the television camera mounted on the rover. Scientists and engineers on Earth could directly monitor the lunar exploration. And those of us at home, watching on television, felt like the third astronaut on the moon. That looks fairly recent, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Okay, now we got the fillet, we got the soil, now we need to sample the rock. Yeah. The astronauts began to collect samples and photograph the area. The samples would consist of rocks picked up with a rake-like device, soil samples, selected rocks, and chips taken from boulders. Can you imagine that, Joe? Here sits this rock, and it's been here since before creatures roamed the sea on our little Earth. They would also drive core tubes into the lunar soil to collect contiguous specimens from beneath the surface. But now it was time to return to the lunar module. Not to end this first work period on the lunar surface, but to begin another phase. I can't believe uh, we came over those mountains. <laughs> we did. They're just a beautiful little valley. Yeah, those are pretty big mountains to fly over, aren't they? After returning to the LEM to load equipment, they moved to a nearby location to set up a science station similar to those left on previous missions. With the establishment of these experiments, a network of scientific stations was achieved which would allow triangulation of events and give us the ability to locate precisely the origin of lunar events. As they worked, one of their instructions was to throw the packings as far as possible from the site. Dave Scott. I'll give you a demonstration here, Joe. Roger, right on here, Joe. Spectacular demonstration. Oh, well, enough of that. Lovely. What was that a demonstration of, by the way? It started out to be of gravity, and it uh, wound up being of uh, centrifugal force, I think. Using an electric drill, Scott sank a tube into the lunar soil into which a probe would be placed to measure heat flow in the lunar material. The difficulty in drilling would delay placement of the second probe until the next day. The science station was then activated and Scott and Irwin closed Falcon's hatch on EVA number one. miles above the moon, Al Warden orbited in the command module Endeavour. Operating experiments, his observations adding to the wealth of scientific data already accumulated. Okay, I'm looking right down on Litro now at a very interesting thing. 
looks like a whole field of uh, small cinder cones down here. The detection of cinder cones, clearly of volcanic origin, helped solve another element of the controversy about how much of the moon was formed by volcanoes and how much by meteoroid impact. Make this bag number 196 a special bag. Yes, sir. Joe, this crater is a gold mine. And there might be diamonds in the next one. Yeah, babe. Then we saw another practical use of television in lunar exploration. And Dave, uh, you're going to want to cinch up Jim's collection bag probably before you go much longer. It's coming uh, very loose there. Okay. Let me do it right now, Joe, Just don't, so we don't forget it. Roger, we sure don't want to lose that one. I don't know what we do without you, Joe. Okay, Jim, let's get on a rover and get back. Okay. It's nice to sit down, isn't it? Oh, it is. Okay, we're on our tracks. Roger. And follow them home. There's sure a lot of neat rocks in uh, Dune. Too bad we can't spend some more time. On your next trip. Yeah, next trip, you're right. They're gonna be seasick. <laughs> what do you expect uh, traveling on the Mari? They returned to the science station where Scott once more manned the drill to place the second heat flow probe and later to get a deep core sample. The difficulty in drilling was shown by Scott's hands, which would carry bruised fingernails from his efforts for several weeks after the mission. Okay, Dave, take heart. You've got just one minute of drilling left. Okay, we made a little money, didn't we? And over fifth. It was time to get back into the LEM and end EVA-2. The drill and attached sections were left in the ground for removal during the next day's traverse. Now it's our friend, huh? Yes, it is. Uh, if we could just get our shoulder under that. <laughs> Their first stop was at the drill they had left during the second EVA. This core tube was the deepest sample ever collected from the moon perhaps the deepest we would ever get. Eight and a half feet beneath the surface, cutting through 58 distinct layers. This would not only tell us more about the lunar structure, but contained in this soil were traces of particles emitted by the sun billions of years ago, which would give us a clue to the early years of the solar system. Hang on. Then Scott and Irwin descended a short distance over the rim of Hadley Rill to get a piece of one of the large blocks thought to be lunar bedrock. It's a big rock there. Sure is. Let's go down and get the chunk of the bedrock here. Get a little closer so you get that big chip out of there. Boy, what a rock. Get ready to move out, Dave. Yep. They buckled their seat belts for the ride back to the lunar module. Oh, what a big mountain that Hadley is. Yeah, it's beautiful. The sun is really fierce. Oh, look at the mountains today, Jim, when they're all sunlit. Isn't that beautiful? It really is. Oh, golly, that's just super. You know, unreal. Hey, I'm reminded of a favorite biblical passage from Psalm. I look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. But of course, we get quite a bit from Houston, too. After a stop to pick up the core samples, they returned to the LEM to close out their final traverse. But first, Scott would make history, canceling a stamp on an interplanetary envelope. I'm very proud to have the opportunity here to play postman. What could be a better place to cancel a stamp than right here at Hadley Rill? 
Then a demonstration of a classic experiment. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Finally, Scott drove the rover away from the LEM so that its TV camera could pick up a picture of the coming liftoff. As the spaceport Risling would say, we're ready for you to come back again to the homes of men on the cool green hills of Earth. Thank you, Joe. We're ready to. But it's been great. 171 hours and 37 minutes. After they had lifted off the planet Earth, Scott and Irwin would lift off its sister planet, accompanied by a musical salute they themselves would provide from a small tape recorder on board. August 4th, they prepared to come home. But even on their last orbit of the moon, they had another experiment. Three, two, one, launch. A very pretty satellite out there. They placed in orbit a sub-satellite, the first ever launched by a manned spacecraft. It was designed to circle the moon for a year, measuring variations in lunar gravity, the strength and direction of interplanetary and Earth magnetic fields, and the flow of charged particles in space. Tracking stations have acquired the satellite. Oh, very good. Then the burn to bring them back to Earth. But their jobs were far from over. 172,000 miles from Earth, Al Warden left the spacecraft to retrieve the 8,000 feet of film contained in the cassettes of the Experiment Bay cameras. Later, they would turn their X-ray spectrometer toward the newly discovered X-ray pulsars, those mysterious black holes in space. At the same time, in accord with the previous plan, an Earth-based Soviet observatory scanned the same areas visually to help derive a model consistent with both sets of observations. During the trip home, the X-ray spectrometer would observe seven X-ray sources and gather 50 hours of galactic data. Then, on August 7th, they looked into the fireball created by the heat of their re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour. And there would be a heart-stopping moment as one of the three parachutes collapsed. However, the landing system was designed to use two parachutes. The third parachute was an added safety factor. Today, that margin paid off. The success of Apollo 15 had been spectacular. The scientific results had been almost unbelievable. In the words of one scientist, a five-for-one mission. Yet while we rejoice in our success, we cannot afford to forget the sometimes painful efforts that gave us these achievements. Spacecraft Commander Dave Scott. I think many people have contributed to this pinnacle we've reached. Some have contributed more than others. And we know of 14 individuals who contributed all they had. And because of that, why well, we left a, a small memorial on the moon, about 20 feet north of Rover 1, in a small, subtle crater, 
there's a simple plaque with 14 names. And those are the names in alphabetical order of all the astronauts and cosmonauts who have died in the pursuit of exploration of space. Near it is a small figure representing a fallen astronaut. We went to the moon as trained observers in order to gather data, uh, not only with our instruments on board, but with our minds. And I'd like to quote a statement from Plutarch, which I think expresses our feelings uh, since we've come back. The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. Thank you. April 22nd. Young and Duke would find themselves strapped into a small electric car called the Rover, bouncing across the lunar plateau known as Descartes. Oh, the old water bag is working super. This is going to be a good day, Charlie. Yeah! Woo! Man, that's a great. Big skid. We're doing uh, 10 clicks, Tony. Covered me with dust on that one. As Young and Duke rode the bucking rover to the lunar formation called Stone Mountain, NASA geologist Farouk El Baz wrote on a blackboard on Earth, there is nothing so far removed from us to be beyond our reach or so hidden that we cannot discover it. Rene Descartes. As John Young would later remark, Apollo 16 would certainly help prove that Rene Descartes was right. Almost like a freshly plowed field. April 21. Mission Commander John Young stepped onto the Descartes Formation, 11.58 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are mysterious and unknown Descartes, Alan Plains, Apollo 16 is going to change your image. While their activities were monitored by mission control, Young and Duke were also observed by scientists, located across the hall in the science support room. After unloading the rover from its storage bay in the lunar module, they planted the flag. Hey, John, this is perfect with the limb and the rover and you and, and the stone mountain and the old flag. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. Off the ground, one more. There we go. Good. Young set up an ultraviolet camera to provide the first astronomical observations from the moon. He took pictures of the Earth's upper atmosphere and magnetosphere and their interaction with the solar wind. He also photographed the interstellar gas present throughout space and the ultraviolet halos that appear around galaxies. Astronomers have long wanted a telescope on the moon. Perhaps this experiment would show the moon an ideal base for future astronomical observations. You, you want two pans? Yeah, we would like two pans. John, sir. I'm not leaning on it. Duke drilled a hole into which a heat flow probe was to be placed, part of one of the experiments attached to the station. As Duke drilled, Young set up the central station and the remainder of the experiments. Then, what many considered the biggest disappointment of the mission. Probably some, just some rocks down there in the regolith, Tony. You know, it, it looks, I bet it's just like the side of that, that fresh uh, crater we saw back near the limb. Charlie, what? Something happened here. What happened? I don't know. Here's a line that pulled loose. That means you've got to uh, you've got to mate all those wires, separate wires in there, and have them insulated from one another. That's right. And uh, if that doesn't occur, what are the chances of shorting out the central station? Well, that's another one that they're working. Uh, on Earth, they tried to figure a way to fix the heat flow. On the moon, the astronauts continued with the other experiments. 
Young placed a series of sensors in the soil, then fired explosive charges, mapping the lunar subsurface much as geologists on Earth use explosives to search for oil. They continue to sample the area and activate the experiments. Then they returned to the rover and prepared for their first trip away from the landing site in search for geological samples. And here we go. Their first traverse would take them about one kilometer west of the landing site. They would make two stops to collect samples and conduct experiments. But it couldn't pick a better spot. John, you're just beautiful. That is the most beautiful sight. What's that? You're standing there on the rim of that crater. This guy I don't really know. You're gonna have to use a hand. Young used a portable instrument to measure the local magnetic field. He would later record the most intense magnetic field ever found on the moon far higher than scientists ever suspected. What's that, Charlie? It's really some crater. As you come around there, there's a rock in the near field on this rim that has some white on the top of it. We'd like you to pick it up as a grab sample. This one right here? That's it. This, this one right here? That's it. You got it right there. Okay, we copy that. There would be one more stop before they got back to the lunar module to close out this EBA. With Duke acting as photographer and Young as driver, they put the rover through a full test. Man, you are really bouncing. Is he on the ground at all? That's 10 kilometers. Huh? He's got about two wheels on the ground. Okay, turn sharp. I have no desire to turn sharp. <laughs> okay, here's a sharpie. Hey, that's great. He's a big rooster tail out of all four wheels. And as he turns, he skids. The back end breaks loose just like on snow. Come on back, John. Hey, the deck is running. Then I'll tell you, Andy's never seen a driver like this. Okay, when he hits the craters and starts bouncing, it's when he gets his rooster tail. He makes sharp turns. <laughs> then it was back to their lunar base, activate experiments, and close out EVA-1. Good. PYs exercise, is that right? Physical fitness, gym level? Hey, that's right. Please don't take pictures of the uh, hot dogs. <laughs> Showing the low residue, high protein diet. Anybody On Earth, the scientists took a break. Tomorrow would be another busy day. April 22nd. The lunar surface temperature in the sun should be around 135 degrees today. Today, they were headed a little over four kilometers south to climb their rover up the side of Stone Mountain. Man, we are really going up a hill, I'll tell you. Their first station, a crater 700 feet above their lunar module. Wow, what a place. What a view, isn't it, John? It's absolutely unreal. We really come up here, uh, Tony. It's just spectacular. I've got... I have never seen it. All I can say is spectacular, and I know y'all are sick of that word, but that my vocabulary is so limited. Well, let's see what we can do. If we got the rake soil, if we got certainly something, we could go to one man sampling and maybe do it. They would make a total of six stops on this traverse, collecting samples from large rocks down through the intermediates to the smallest soil particles. They would operate experiments measuring the strength of local magnetic fields to measuring the resistance of the soil to compaction. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-
The sampling time used up. It was time to return to the rover and head back to the lunar module. And they did it in two minutes less travel time right than they were pre-planned. Fantastic. Tony, how about an extension, you guys? We feeling good? Is that all we're going to do tonight was sit around and talk? But with the limited oxygen and water in the backpacks, it was finally time to close out EVA-2. April 23rd, the decision had been made not to try and fix the broken heat flow experiment because of the time and complexities involved. Traverse number three. Today, Young and Duke would head north about five kilometers to North Ray Crater, the largest lunar crater to be sampled by men. Outstanding. Hey, Tony, it seems to me this is a... Uh a more subdued surface over here than going towards South Ray. Oh, spectacular. Just spectacular. Wow. Sorry, Charlie. Beautiful. Beautiful. I gotta keep my eye on the driving. That's great. Jack, that's a good point to remember. All three crews now tend to think they're there before they get there. I remember. Man, does this thing have steep walls. They said 60 degrees. Now, I tell you, I can't see to the bottom of it, and I'm as close to the edge as I'm going to get. <laughs> That's the truth. Now, the routine, if anything on the moon can be called that. Test, collect, photograph. Keep moving. Time is precious on the moon. They look like drill holes is what they look like. You do that in West Texas, and you get a rattlesnake. Here, you get permanently shattered soil. How about rolling that one over? No way. Then, one of the most spectacular discoveries of the mission. Look at the size of that biggie. It is a biggie, isn't it? It may be further away than we think. Because no, it's not very far. It was just right beyond you. And we better press on for the big boulder. Okay, we're headed that way. You get the tongs, uh, John? Yep. We are. I'll carry the rake. That big black dot. Fantastic. Like right here. If, if we could see to the bottom, we could say for sure if this big black rock is right out of the bottom. But uh, my guess from the old photographs is it probably is. Okay, that sounds like a good guess. God, you going to be worried at it? No. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like they were standing right there. Look at the size of that rock. <laughs> Curious what they're going to look like when they stand next to it. <laughs> we can see. The closer I get to it, the bigger it is. Yeah, but look at the permanent shattered part, Charlie. On this side over here? Yeah. And as our crew slowly sinks, <laughs> <laughs> we bet a father disappeared into the sunset. <laughs> well, Tony, that's your house rock right there. Very good. Don't get too near the edge of that thing. It falls off. Look, look over, look over at your right. It falls off pretty good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, Keep going. <laughs> And we encourage you just to look for some variety. But now it was time to head back to their base and close out the EVA. All right, we think you could just about uh, head south now. Yeah, the only reason. During the previous EVA, a section of a rear fender had come off the rover, causing the astronauts to receive occasional showers of lunar dirt. And that's a beautiful sight. 
Young parked the rover, then moved out to join Duke. Enter the lunar module and prepare for liftoff. Boy, Houston, the beauty of this place is just absolutely incredible. What a ride, what a ride. Pitch over on time. Together in orbit, the two spacecraft pirouetted, each inspecting the other. This is one of the fastest maneuvers I've made in a long time. The inspections complete, the command module and lunar module maneuvered to docking. John Young, Ken Mattingly, and Charlie Duke, reunited aboard the command module, settled down for tomorrow's tasks jettison the lunar module and burn out of orbit to come home. It had been quite a mission. In John Young's words, I think we've seen as much in, uh, in 10 days as most people see in 10 lifetimes. April 27, the last day. The crew looked out their windows through the 5,000 degree fireball of re-entry at their native planet. After checking out the spacecraft in Earth orbit, they burned out of orbit and headed toward the moon. Houston, we're right in the middle of a snowstorm. Turn out there, long way. Ron Evans, at the controls of the Command Module America, moved in to dock with the lunar module Challenger. They pulled Challenger free of the booster's third stage, then continued the three-day coast to the moon. Oh, man, we're level with the top of the seats now. Okay, stand by for pitch over. Oh, are we coming in? Pitch over. Proceeded. And there it is, Houston. There's Camelot. Wide out target. I see it. We got them all. 42 degrees, 37 degrees, to 5,500. 53 degrees. Okay, I've got bar A, I've got poppy, I've got the triangle. That's 2,500 feet, 52 degrees. 
Eight shot is good. At 2,000, eight shot is good. Fuel is good. Going down at 10, cut the eight shot. The fuel's good. 110 feet, stand by for some dust. Little forward, G. Bend her forward a little. 90 feet. Little forward velocity. 80 feet. Going down at 3. Getting a little dust. Going down about 2. Very little dust. Very little dust. Stand by for touchdown. Stand by. 25 feet. Down at 2. Feels good. 20 feet. Going down at 2. 10 feet. 10 feet. That contact. That push. Engine stop. Okay, Houston, the Challenger has landed. Roger, Challenger, that's super. Houston, you can tell America that Challenger is a source literal. December 11. Cernan, then Schmidt, left the lunar module to begin their first EVA. As I step off at the surface at Taurus Littrell, we'd like to dedicate the first steps of Apollo 17 to all those who made it possible. Their first job was to unload equipment, including their rover, the electric car in which they would drive to the exploration sites. That's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. We thank you very much. As Cernan drove the equipment-laden rover, Schmidt carried the scientific experiments package called ALSEP. Hey, do you need me, Gene? Nope. I'm going to go deploy an ALSEP. Have at it. In Houston, scientists in the science support room watched correlating and directing their movements. Okay, Bob, I've got my tools of the trade right here. I'm As Schmidt set up the various experiments, Cernan drilled a series of holes, both to collect core samples and to implant experimental probes. Yeah. Oh, we're out, we're out to get the blanket of camel out for sure now. Yeah. Man, it didn't feel like this stuff was that hard. No, I'll get it. I knew there was something I needed to do. Get the jack in over here, other side. Let me, let me uh, put some weight here. Oh, he's going slowly, though. Very slowly. I'm going to get this thing out now that I got it. Boys, you know, that's what you call getting down into your work. Yeah, it's 29 and a half minutes from now, but remember, they left this side a little bit late. There it is. Okay. So Jim, you better make it clear to Parker that we got to pull out. On the moon and on the Earth, they were fighting time now. There are just so many hours of oxygen and water in the backpacks. So many hours of life in the vacuum of the moon. We're up in the area. Watch that cable. Cable, cable, cable. Watch the cable. Cable number one. They're all fixed, Lee. They'll break the whole world before they'll break the cable this time. With the ALSEP functioning, they left the site for a shortened sampling traverse. Well, many parts of the ALSEP are functioning very well. The uh, heat flow experiment is working excellently. It's transmitting back temperature data. The uh, cooling down is still cooling down from the, uh, the drilling process, and in a few hours, they should be starting to get true heat flow information. Let's see if I can't crack the uh, corner and get that contact. See if I can't get it. <laughs> Look at the folders out there. <laughs> it was time to head back to the Challenger, activate experiments, and get back inside. Man. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Oh, May. May. May is the month. May, that's right. May is the year of the month. Oh, what a nice day. Oh, 
Funny, there's not a cloud in the sky, except in the earth. They would have one test before they got to work exploring. The previous day, they had broken a rear fender of the rover. The dust thrown up was causing trouble. Apollo 16 commander, John Young, had worked that night in a pressure suit on a way to fix the fender. On the moon, the astronauts put it together. The fender section formed from a lunar map molded with tape, then held in place with clamps from the lunar module telescope. It was a repair that would last the remainder of the mission. Then Schmidt moved out to place one of several explosive packages which would be detonated after they left the moon, mapping the lunar subsurface, much as earthly geologists explore for oil. Cernan would pick him up in the rover for the drive to the first site on this traverse, Station 2. They're somewhere along this rim where they can see. But they're, but they're dropping, Bill, so they must be coming across that. We're right where we wanted to be for Station 2. And it looks like a great place. Big blocks. It looks like quite a bit of variety from here. Different colors, anyway. Pretty hard, isn't it? That boat is going to roll. Man, that is hard. <laughs> Just don't stub your toe. The foreground features are somewhat different. That's simply because they were farther up under the hill, I think. But that's, otherwise, that's remarkable. Powder, it's obviously very, uh, very cohesive because it, it, uh, the bottom of the core is not smooth. It's very jaggedy and fragmental-like. Gene's finished with the uh, uh, score tube. Then we should be able to go. If we get that get all of that. Jack Schmidt having a few problems. They would sample several locations on this EVA, okay. but none would cause more excitement than the find okay. of the crater called Shorty. They had to leave Shorty Crater and its orange soil and push on. Time, the enemy of the lunar investigator on the moon and on Earth. Okay, Bob, I'm on the pad. And about 4.30, a Wednesday afternoon, as I step out onto the plains of Taurus Lichtral. Beautiful valley. December 13th. Yesterday, they had explored the south end of the valley. Today, they would go north. Yeah, well, let's ask for an extension figure. This is the last time for you to really go to bat for us, Jim. We know you'll do it for us. Send them the to that Yep. Holy smiley. <laughs> Why are we on a slope? You okay? Man, that's rough country in there, isn't it? Well, they're looking across Henry. Yeah. And let me see what it is. Oh, 
Apollo science will continue, and I'm sure my, through the mysteries uh, will continue to come out for many years to come. But of this I'm sure, man has learned that space is his to explore, and man will return to space to explore, to the moon and beyond. I'm firmly convinced that it's changed the whole basis of philosophy, including religion. I don't think that we've begun to see uh, what the era of spaceflight really is. It, uh, we've got a long way to go, and I hope I'm living when we leave this solar system on a venture to find another planet Earth. more it was time. Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt returned to the rover to drive back to Challenger. But before they left the surface of the moon, there would be a brief ceremony. It's a rock composed of many fragments of many sizes and many shapes. When we return this rock, or some of the others like it to Houston, We'd like to share a piece of this rock with so many of the countries throughout the world. We hope that this will be a symbol of what our feelings are, what the feelings of the Apollo program are, and a symbol of mankind that we can live in peace and harmony in the future. And a final word from the last man on the moon. I'd like to just let what I believe history will record that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. While Cernan and Schmidt closed out the last moonwalk and prepared for tomorrow's liftoff, Ron Evans worked on in orbit. Photograph, observe, describe. Keep operating the cameras and experiments in the science experiments bay. In orbit, as on the surface, the seconds are precious. 99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Run away, Houston. That's your good. Excellent. Good shoulder. Good shoulder. Roger, you have good trust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. Take off to 1,500 feet. And eight shot looks good. On the descent stage of Challenger, forever on the moon, they left a plaque reading, Here man completed his first explorations of the moon, December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. One revolution later, Cernan and Schmidt caught up with Evans and prepared for docking. Good to see you. Good to have you all back up here. It's been a good trip. Man, yeah, that Jones is a beautiful vehicle. You bet you. December 16th, burn out of lunar orbit and head home to Earth. Houston, America, found some fair winds and following seas, and we're on our way home. <laughs> hey, this is great. Talk, talk about being a spaceman. This is it. December 17th, 170,000 miles from Earth. Ron Evans left the command module. Hello, Mom. <laughs> we see you, Ron. Looking great. Okay. Hey, John. How you doing? Hi, right, Jamie. Evans was retrieving film canisters from the two cameras and the lunar sounding radar. Data vital to the scientists on Earth. And the lesson's in. 
Before he got back inside, Evans took a last look at the Crescent Earth. In two more days, they would be home. December 19th. They rode inside a 5,000 degree fireball through the atmosphere of Earth. Stowed in the spacecraft, almost 250 pounds of the moon. closes a golden chapter in the age of space exploration. In a way, it brings a close to what has been a very romantic era in space exploration. But, and I want to make this very strong, the book is still being written. The moon, a lonely world in the absence of man. But here we have left our mark, a signature attesting a legacy to future generations. We stood on the shoulders of giants and touched the moon. <laughs>